Good morning. It's good to see you. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I know that for some of y'all that took advantage of our, of our nursery uh, this morning, y'all are feeling really great. I've had two different families tell me when they dropped off their kids at nursery that they almost went to brunch instead of coming here. And you know who you are who said that. So if you are here, I'm glad that you're here. If you would rather be at brunch, uh, if you are uh, joining us from a place of joy or sorrow, wherever you find yourself this morning, we're glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Redeemer. Uh, What is Redeemer? Well, Redeemer is a church, and what that means is we're a community of people, and we're trying to learn how to love God, and we're trying to learn how to love our neighbor. And the way that we go about trying to do that is we gather together each Sunday so that we can worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that we might be able to rest in His love that He has for us. And we also get together throughout the week individually and over small groups. We hang out together. We bake together. We get our vaccines together. And we we try to remind one another of His great love for us. And as we rest and we remind We delight to spread throughout Midtown here in Memphis so that we can reflect His love to our neighbors. We we dream of seeing our city flourishing anew through the redemptive love of Jesus. And so, it's a little bit about who we are. We're a community of people. We're trying to learn how to love God and love our neighbor as we rest and remind and reflect His love here in Midtown. And uh, what we've been doing throughout this season of Epiphany and and now kind of as we're finishing up Lent, we've been looking through this book in the New Testament called 1 Peter, and here we are at the very end. We've made it. And uh, there's so much that's packed into this final chapter, but I want to highlight what I really see is kind of the main theme of this final chapter, which is Peter's call for us to embody this posture of humility, to embody a posture of humility. And really, I think humility is kind of… everybody's talking about humility these days. Um, David Brooks, who is a, an author, a New York Times columnist, uh, I found out this week, teaches a course on humility at Yale, which is kind of fascinating. Malcolm Gladwell uh, has spoken at length about how humility, the role that humility plays in leadership. In fact, I just, I, I looked this week if there were any TED Talks on humility, and I found not one, not two, but 17 different TED Talks about humility. There may have been more. I just stopped looking. Seventeen. Even Kendrick Lamar is encouraging us to sit down and be humble. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's books on, on how humility impacts success and personal health and, and leadership. There's articles. In fact, one of the art, my favorite article that I, the favorite title that I looked up this week about uh, humility said, why humility is so attractive in how to increase your own which feels a little self-serving, which kind of undermines the whole point anyway. But anyway, I don't presume that everyone here is a Christian. I don't presume that everyone puts any stock in what the Bible has to say. But here's this conversation happening in our culture about humility, and I want to put this passage forward as just another voice in the conversation just to see if it holds out any wisdom to us as we think about this thing called humility. So I I want to look at this passage really under three different headings. I want us to see the call to humility, the case for humility, and the key to humility. The call, the case, the key. Cool? Commencing. Okay. Um, the call to humility. Well, like I said, this, this, the call to humility is really at the center of this passage. It begins, if you noticed, by thinking through this relationship between a pastor and, and members of the congregation. You see in verse 1, he's talking to elders, that's church leaders, and he says in verse 2, shepherd the flock, exercising oversight. He's, he's talking about having authority. He's talking about having power. What does it look like to have power and authority in the church and in the kingdom? Well, look at verse 3. He, he elaborates and he says, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. He's saying just because you might happen to be at the top of the, the org chart doesn't mean you get to be a tyrant. You know, when, when you and I typically think of somebody in power, um, we may think of the, like the character that Meryl Streep plays in, in Devil Wears Prada. You know, just this no-nonsense, my way or the highway kind of boss, bulldozing everybody. I get to call the shots. 
And what Peter is doing here is he's saying that's not what authority looks like in the church specifically, and it's not what authority and power looks like in the kingdom in generally. It does not look like lording over, domineering over people. It, it looks like being examples, representing our servant king, Jesus. And then he talks to members. In fact, if, if you look at verse 5, he says, you who are younger, probably meaning younger members of the congregation, what, what are you supposed to do? He says, be subject to the elders, meaning don't puff up your chest and be stubborn and resistant and obstinate and recalcitrant. He's saying, defer, yield, submit, be subject. In other words, have humility. In fact, he looks at everybody in this final verse, and he kind of wraps it all up. Verse 5, uh, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. That's the big idea. All of you, all of us, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Notice he's not just talking about having a humble disposition, although that's important. That's great. But he's talking about social dynamics, He's talking about how we relate to one another, have humility toward one another. What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, Thomas Howard, who is this uh, Catholic author, he made the point, he says, if you think about it, there are really only two different ways to live. You make every decision that you make every single day based off of one of two different operating systems that is at work in your soul in that moment. And these two different principles that he explains are these. Very simply, my life for yours or your life, my life for me. That's it. My life for yours or my life for me. My life for yours means I, I elevate your needs and your priorities over mine. I'm willing to defer to my comfort, my convenience for your sake. My life for me, I elevate my needs over you. My comfort, my convenience over you. And every decision that we make every single day gets based on one of these two different operating systems. What does that look like? If you take it out of abstract land and you bring it into real life, here's what that looks like. Uh, here's a couple of silly examples. Uh, you know, in our neighborhood, um, you know, we, wa we walk with our kids a lot, walk as a family, walk to school, and if there's a, you know, we're walking on the sidewalk, if there's another family or another person on the same sidewalk walking towards us, there's a little bit of a situation, especially in COVID land where we've got to space out. There's not enough room on the sidewalk for both of us to walk. So who's going to defer? Who's going to step into the street and let the other person by? Who's going to have humility toward the other? Or here's another example. You're um, in, in the car waiting on, you know, the highway or whatever, and you're, you're, you're in the long line of car, and here, here comes the car up beside you with the blinker on trying to get in your lane. Do you let them into your lane? Or do you scooch up inches away from the car in front of you? Don't budge. Don't let them in. Don't let them in. Or here's another example. You're at, you're at the uh, grocery store, you're, and you're waiting in the checkout aisle, and you're up next to, to, to go, and you're looking at your cart, and you have 7,000 items in your cart, and you look at the guy behind you who's got a banana. Do you let them in front of you? I mean, you were there first. You have every right to go forward, but whose needs gets prioritized in that moment. I realize these are, these are small, silly examples. My point is all of these small decisions that you're making, a thousand of them every single day is based off of, is it my life for yours or my life for me? And I will say this. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I do want to say there is a tension here because your needs do matter. You, you are limited. You have boundaries. In fact, if you were in the car on the way to the hospital and the person next to you is pregnant and they're in labor, maybe you don't defer. Maybe you, your needs actually matter more in that moment. My point is the call to humility, my life for yours, my life for me, which one do you trend towards? Peter is calling us to trend in this direction, to say more and more, how can I give? How can I make space? How, how, how can I defer? How, how can I allow other people to cut into my comfort, my, call, my, my convenience? How can I elevate their needs over mine? That's this call to humility. But secondly, what is the case for this? In other words, why should we do this? Because this is really hard. And uh, some people would say this is actually dangerous. I mean, if you're always deferring, always giving up for other people, it's just going to make you weak, spineless. You're just going to be a doormat. What is the case? Well, here's the reason that Peter gives for why we should do this. 
uh, verse 5, again, he says at the end, for, meaning here's the reason, why should you do this, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That is an amazing verse. God opposes pride, the proud. That is strong language. This is saying if you want to assert yourself, I call the shots. I don't defer to anybody. I want to be first, me. Peter is saying in the end, you will be opposed by God himself. If you want to puff yourself up, in the end, God will bring you down. And consequently, if you are brought down, if you are willing to make yourself low, in the end you will be lifted up. You will receive His grace. There's this principle of reversal here, that if you are determined to make yourself big, God will make you small. And if you are willing to be made small, in the end God will make you big. Peter reinforces this idea in verse 6. He elaborates, he says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Peter's tapping into this idea of what some people have called the upside-down nature of the kingdom, that the way up is the way down, and the way down is actually the way up. This is why Jesus is all the time saying, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The first will be last. The last will be first. If you want to seek your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you will find it. You know, as I mentioned ago, Thomas Howard, who I mentioned, um, wrote this great book called Splendor in the Ordinary. And I heard Tim Keller reference uh, a passage from this book in, in a sermon that I, that I included in your bulletin. I want, I want to, and I got a lot of help from him under this particular point, but I want to um, I want to read you this excerpt from this Thomas Howard book. Here's what he says. He says, no child has ever received life except through the laying down of the mother's life and bearing and nourishing him. And somebody has to lay down his or her life to care for and train and provide for children year after year. We live only because someone else has lived by this principle. In other words, here's what he's saying. The only reason any of us are ever, the, the only reason any of us are here is because we had parents that were willing to sacrifice, give their, their time, their money, their sleep. See, this is just the, this is, this is how it works. If a child is going to thrive in this life, then a parent has to give up their, their sleep, their, their comfort, their money. But if a parent says, I'm, I'm unwilling to do that, I want to hold on to my way of life, I'm not willing to sacrifice my comfort, my habits, my hobbies, my convenience, then the child suffers. The child pays for it. Either the parent sacrifices so that the child has life, or the child gets sacrificed so that the parent has life. That's just how reality works. Life only happens when somebody dies, when somebody's willing to give of themselves. Quote, he keeps going. Thomas Howard keeps going. He says, quote, this laying down of life always entails a death. It is death, in effect, to my 10 minutes when I give them over to help you get something done. It's death to your privilege if you let someone else in urgent need cut into line in front of you. It's my, the my life for yours principle is the only one on which any life at all is possible. To embrace it is to live but to refuse it is to spiritually die and spread death. That's the idea. The case for why we should be humble is because this is the way that reality is. This is woven into the fabric of how we do life. If you want to see life happen, if you want to live in a place that is flourishing, if you want to see Midtown really thrive, do you know how you get there? Humbling yourself a willingness to sacrifice yourself for somebody else. That's just how it works. That's how life works. And you know why that's the way that life works? Why that's the way that reality is? Is because this is how God is. If you think about the very essence of who God is, I know we're getting into like deep waters at this point. But God in and of himself is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a community of persons eternally loving each other, deferring to each other, glorifying each other, honoring each other, God made a world in which the my life for yours principle is the only way that life can actually happen because that's the way that He is. And so when you, 
When you give up your life for others, you are going in, you are in sync with the grain of reality. And when you go against it, when you say, my life for me, I, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, at the bottom. I want to be on the top. I don't want to serve anybody. I want them to serve me. I don't want to be last. I want to be first. Don't you see? <laughs> That's where everything unravels. That's where war and violence and, and uh, injustice and economic injustice and racial injustice and all of the issues that we're dealing with, all, all the abuse, all the oppression, all goes back to this my life for me. Society, relationships, culture, it breaks down because you're going against the grain of reality. So how do you do it? Because it is hard. It's really unnatural. How can you be humble towards other people? Well, let's look at this last thing, the key to humility. Look at verse 10. 10 plays on this uh, same upside-down dynamic. He says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You see what he's saying? He's saying you might suffer a little bit right now, but in time, God himself will confirm, strengthen, uh, restore, and establish you. But did you notice how he describes God in that sentence? There's a lot of different ways, a lot of different words he could have used to describe God, and he chooses to use this language, that he is the God of all grace. That's the key. It is understanding that at the center of the universe is a God who is described as the God of all grace. Even look at verse 5. He gives grace to the humble. The good news of the gospel is that God's healing power comes into your life and comes into the world through grace. Grace is not something that you, that you achieve. It is only something that can be received. Here's why this matters. It, it, you know, you think about if Jesus came as this military general and he showed up and he said, follow me, follow me and, and be like me, then, then only the strong could be saved, only the courageous and the valiant could actually do it. If he showed up as, this, uh, as a philosopher, as this spiritual guru and said, you know, here's the truth, believe this truth, devote yourself to this truth, and then you will be saved, then uh, only the spiritual would be saved. Only the wise, only like the deep thinkers and deep feelers could actually do it. But don't you see the problem with that? Don't you see how exclusive that would be? If Jesus came in strength, then salvation would only happen through your strength, by your beefing up your resume, you you impressing God with how devoted you are and how committed you are to Him. What about people like me that aren't that strong and aren't that good? People that are weak and, and struggle and are a mess and are constantly messing up. What about people like us? The good news is that Jesus did not come in strength. He came in weakness. He set aside his glory, and he came as this homeless peasant. And here we are, even celebrating, you know, Palm Sunday, this day where Jesus enters into Jerusalem during the last week of his life, and he does not roll in on a white horse. You know, he doesn't show up with a tank. He shows up on on the foal of a donkey, a little baby, you know, a young donkey, which was this, you know, animal used, you know, in the service industry, a beast of burden. He, you know, he shows up in humility. His whole existence is embodying this my life for yours principle all the way up until his very last breath, where even on the cross, he has given away his power, he's given away his glory, he's given away his very life for you. You know, it's amazing, on the cross… Jesus is being treated, even though he lived such a a beautiful life of humility, he is being treated as if he lived his entire life on the my life for me principle. He is experiencing in his very being the cosmic unraveling of what happens in God's universe when you live the my life for me principle. Why? God is treating him as if he were sin itself, and God is opposing the proud right there on the cross, so that you and I 
could be exalted, so that you and I could be lifted up. If Jesus comes in weakness, which he does, that means anybody can come. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be strong. You don't have to be put together. All you need is need. You just show up with empty hands, and you know what you receive? You receive the God of all grace. If you are willing to humble yourself, you will be exalted. One final thought, and then I'm done. Look at verse 12. I love how this letter ends. Verse 12, Peter, Peter talks about this man who was helping him write this particular letter. He says, by Sylvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I love that. Peter closes out this whole letter by saying, look, everything that I just wrote you, it is about the true grace of God. Now that you know what it is, you know what I want you to do? Stand in it. Isn't that an awesome image? Plant your life firmly in this tidal wave of grace that never runs out. Plant yourselves in it. Because when, the more and more you fixate your imagination on the very grace of God given to you, the more you drink that in, do you know what that does? it actually starts to convince your heart that you have a great need for a Savior and you have a great Savior for your need. And when those two things come together, you know what that makes you? It makes you humble. For you to actually know in my being, I have a great need for a Savior and I have a great Savior for my need. You become humble and you begin to now live your life. If Jesus was willing to give up his comfort and his convenience for me, I can give up my comfort and my convenience for you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Consider that an invitation for you this morning. Let me pray. Father, thank you that you were willing to come in humility and in weakness so that anybody could connect with you. Anybody, no matter how messed up, how much we struggle, how deeply entrenched our our pride actually is, that if we just show up with need, you will receive us. I pray that that would humble all of us, that it would decimate our pride in deeper and newer ways, that we would become this winsome, confident, gracious, humble community, willing to give of ourselves and our resources and our time for the sake of others. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.